I'll just tell you a couple brief words about Nikki. Um, I had started hearing her name a couple different places, Sally Calhoun, and then, then Spencer called me and he goes, boy, you've got to meet this gal. She's just doing some amazing stuff. So I watched a bunch of her talks online and I'm going, oh my God, this is incredible. And then Jeff Sue from our, our hub here in Colorado saw her somewhere and he said, you got to get her lined up for your talk. And I said, you know, I talked to her last week. We already got her lined up. So uh, we're super excited to have Nikki. So Nikki, make your way up and uh, we'll get started with your talk. Good afternoon. It is late in the afternoon. I'm going to need y'all to do better than that. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. That's how I know that you're awake and with me. I am going to do my very best to be engaging, but the school teacher in me, if I notice you staring off into space or a little inattentive, might do some pausing to do some deep breaths here and there. So I just want to start by saying that I am. Um, I find myself getting strangely emotional about soil. And this conference, I have had many moments of just sitting in the back going, these are such good people. Yeah. This is such good work. And even the, um, the, last, the last presentation, honoring people who've done really good work is very important. So who am I? I've been grappling with some really big questions this year. I'm going to get into a little bit more of the history of my work soon, but I have mostly focused on people of color in urban communities, economic development through food systems, and climate change. So taking you on a journey, this year I'm asking questions like, how can natural resource management be really, really good for everyone, including communities of color? How can it help to bridge different communities who don't have a chance to talk to each other? What if it's possible to care for our ecosystem and have it be an economic generator for those who have been most marginalized by all of the bad stuff that's happened in our economy? Where does technology fit into all of this? One thing is that we can fear our innovation potential as humans, but the thing is economic development has the potential to really bridge communities culturally. That's what I focus on. I am a soil nerd. And I look at the people dimension to all of that. So not to depress you, we're going to speed through this. Where are we right now? 60 years of topsoil, no water storage and capture, scary stuff, et cetera. The nutrient density piece of what's happened to the soil is one of the most interesting things to me, because I worked in urban food deserts, right? The most food insecure person in America is the African-American single mother. And I worked so hard to get people access to fresh fruits and vegetables, only to discover there weren't that many nutrients in them. It was disheartening, to say the least. So we've also got economic disparity. There's the wealth gap. And the piece that I focus on, again, is the people and the social aspect. We have some tension in this country right now. Don't know if you've been paying attention to the news. Some stuff happening. Black Lives Matter is a huge thing for me personally and for communities. But the piece that I want to focus on is what's underneath all that. There are a lot of people in this country who feel like you don't see me, you don't respect my physical body or my identity, and that I'm being erased. It's a common thing, this feeling. Not just in one community. There are a lot of people who feel like they're being erased. The alt-right is included in that. There is a common thread of not being seen or acknowledged or having space to be. So how can we, if we're attending to the entire society, interact with this? So the risk, if we don't attend to this, is governance will continue to get worse and worse. The divides will continue to expand. And we're not going to get anywhere. We're going to continue to make the same mistakes. And we have done our economic development on the backs of other people and on the backs of the earth. There's a new way of doing this. So I want to connect the dots between a lot of what's been spoken about today and some of the deeper complexity around how to integrate people into that story in a really good way. What does this look like? 
My work over the years has tried to address this complexity and integrate people in a really good way in the economic development story. I was the executive director of both People's Grocery and Green for All. People's Grocery does economic development and public health work around urban food deserts. So that community I worked in, West Oakland, 30,000 people, 52 liquor stores, no full service grocery store. So between seven and $8 million of uncaptured revenue was leaving the community and wasn't becoming an economic generator when it really could have. We worked on you know, the usual suspects in urban food desert work, community gardens, partnership with the local hospital, economic development, generator for local food businesses, um, spun off a full service grocery store, did a lot of really good work. When I was the executive director of Green for All, we focused a lot on having African Americans understand and support the president's clean power plan. Now, there's some misunderstandings about the clean power plan and whether or not it's actually good for people of color and low income people. So we wanted to make sure that the, the good climate change message was getting to the communities that really needed it. You know, doing all of this work, considering that I bounced back and forth between food systems and climate change, there was something missing. I couldn't really put my finger on it, but it felt like the integration of the two. Being at Green for All was really eye-opening because there was this moment, I keep talking about this moment, but it was deep. Being in DC at one of those gatherings that happened in DC, after hours, lots of alcohol, talking to a climate scientist who scared the living out of me, <laughs> right? He basically told me the underground story and was just like, we're all gonna die. Climate change, two, two degrees, there's no way. We're not stopping emissions, we're just gonna die. So I thought, oh, well, that's terrible. But not just for everybody, right? Of course it's terrible for everybody, but it's gonna be worse for my people first. So what are we gonna do? What am I even doing? So I had this crisis, like there's no hope. What am I doing with my life? So early 2015, that's where I was. What am I doing with my life? And then somebody invited me to this workshop on soil carbon sequestration. I said, that's a lot of words. Okay, I'll go, sure. And on the way there, I listened to a TED talk by this dude named Alan Savory. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm listening to this TED talk driving on the road every two minutes going, this is great. Are you serious? So I show up at this workshop like, yes, yes, revert, desertification, yes. I am an African-American woman who works in urban communities with people of color to do economic development. Where do I fit when it comes to soil health? <laughs> and they were like, well, that is a great question. We should... You should get on that. <laughs> so that's now what I do. My new firm is about that question. And over the last couple of years, a lot of the work has been trying to lift up the complexity that exists, that helps to answer that question and helps to bridge these divides. And the great thing, so this year, a lot of the work has been doing interviews. What's, what's happening in the field? Let's lift up who's already doing it, who maybe these bright spots, they're just not talking to each other. So 40 some odd interviews with people in all of these different sectors, it was a lot. Biomimicry, local economies, food systems, soil science, textiles, journalism, there was a lot of people. And what's incredible was to see that the lifting up of what's already happening and maybe adding a dash or two of complexity here and there, and then having an incredible communications infrastructure can really help, right? And that's, you know, that's how I roll. I love communications, you know, social media. I like that stuff. So what do we do? A few initiatives I want to highlight here. The No Regrets Initiative is a rancher slash investor slash philanthropist in California who has what she calls a regenerative asset management strategy. All of her wealth is going toward building the health of soil for climate change purposes. And she wants to encourage other folks to have a regenerative <coughs> asset management strategy. 
incredible stuff they're doing. And they're like, great, we want to talk to other philanthropists and investors. How do we do that? So we came in with the communications infrastructure. The website should be finished in the next three weeks. It's going to have a soil health index with any and all info that would be useful for an investor or philanthropist to make decisions about investing in soil health. It's going to be indexed on the website. Really fun stuff about how we can drink our way into salvation because there are ways to eat food and drink good drinks that actually build soil health. It's going to be a fun, incredibly interactive place to shift capital. That's the goal there. Now, one thing that comes up when it comes to this question about people of color, disadvantaged communities, and soil health is that there are things called food justice, environmental justice. Grassroots groups have been building soil forever because that's just one of the beautiful things about groups on the ground. There isn't this compartmentalization of things. There may not be the language, but the orientation toward holistic ways of being is already present. So the second project is a concept paper that we're doing with the Carbon Cycle Institute and the Globe Trotter Foundation, which is a part of the No Regrets Initiative, to lift up the intersection of agriculture and social justice in the state of California and connect it back to soil health, to give a framework within which people can think about social equity and soil health. That should also be out in the next three weeks. And finally, we talked a bit about fashion. Organization called Fibershed in California is looking at soil to soil clothing, climate beneficial wool. Great organization. And this was where the majorities of the interviews, the majority of the interviews came from. Because there's a way that the implications of this work in terms of creating a vision, that, that cultural divide that I talked about in the beginning, we are in desperate need of a vision that people can see themselves within right now. So that's what this paper is going to be. It's going to be the vision that bridges that gap between all of the marginalized communities that have suffered when it comes to rural, white, working class Americans, when it comes to urban people of color, when it comes to the soil itself, how we can build businesses and economic development generators that can actually bridge all of those gaps. And there were some incredible things that came out of this paper. This is one of them. In terms of the things that are already happening that are really exciting, 3D printing, manufacturing, biomimicry, troubleshooting. There are people who are looking at the fact that nature has a limited palette. We can put said limited palette in 3D printers. There are people who can build businesses developing said limited palette for 3D printers in ways that regenerate landscapes. My question is, how do we employ people and entrepreneurs how do we support entrepreneurs who may be from unlikely communities doing that kind of work? There's holistic land management and soil carbon sequestration. There's conservation land. How do we do all of that at the same time? Agriculture can be a bit wiggly. Lots of arguments there. It's not you know, much easier in conservation, but there's a lot of conservation groups that are thinking about this who already have soil scientists employed who are doing really good work. And my question again, jobs programs, economic development possibilities, what does this look like? And finally, people who are really thinking a lot about how to build the communication bridge between urban and rural communities. And I mean in highly, highly sophisticated ways. Organizations that are looking at really, there is one organization in particular that's doing incredible work that has urban and rural roundtables and figures out how to build regional infrastructure. And then the issues that come up with all of that. A lot of this paper and a lot of the interviews were about the complexities that come up. Friday night football in rural communities. How that is actually really impactful when it comes to building economic development prowess. The difficulty with hiring felons and creating soft skills in a meaningful way. The fact that technology is terrifying to some people when it comes to being good innovation instead of innovation that's going to erase us. There's a lot of complexity there that we have to engage, but that complexity can be an opportunity. So what did I learn in all of this? 
I learned that my people of color, urban story, was a really narrow one. I was looking to save the earth and I was looking at disadvantaged communities and I wasn't including all of them. It was incredibly humbling for me to start working with ranchers and go out to rural communities and realize that I was one of the people that had erased so much of this country in my mind when it came to developing solutions. And my background is really urban people of color from the time I was a kid. So the fact that I could, in a couple of years, get deeply inspired by soil and pivot and now be that person in the meetings that's like, what about the ranchers, though? <laughs> what's, up, what's up with rural economic development, though? Like, just claiming it. Like, I'm a white rancher. It's deep. And soil was the thing that inspired that in me. It was the hope. Right? It was the fact that this was a vision that could actually save us all. And the fact that I learned that we all have to work toward it together if it's going to work. So now, carbon efficiency. I was a reducing carbon emissions chick for a long time. Now I talk about carbon efficiency. Because it turns out carbon is a cycle. That was the main thing that came up in the social justice and agriculture conversation that it's just in different places and you gotta move it into the different places. It's not like once you reduce emissions, there's nothing left to do. And those two worlds aren't talking to each other as much as they really could. The collective vision isn't quite there. There was another interview we did with a large environmental organization, one of the big greens, who's doing a lot of work in rural communities when it comes to wind and solar power, but they weren't holding a vision for the members of that community around how that could be paired with the things that community has historically cared about in terms of ranching and agriculture to create a comprehensive carbon efficiency vision that includes soil carbon sequestration with wind and solar. This is what I'm talking about. It's so close, we're almost there. We just have to get a little better at it. And in terms of getting a little better, our work focuses on regenerative systems, which is what I've been talking about, and regenerative people because there's a lot of good ideas out there. And a lot of times the things that make initiatives not work is that people don't know how to play well in a group. <laughs> Egos come up, especially if you're dealing with communities that may not have spent as much time together, or there's some mis you know, misconceptions between said communities about the other. One of them thinks the other one's lazy and don't do much work because I work with my hands. You stupid. The other community is like, what, you don't have the internet? You stupid. And then they're just at odds with one another. That came up a lot in the interviews as well. So when I say we talk about regenerative people work, this is a 10th dot consulting as a partner of ours. It's a mixture of organizational or gestalt organizational development with yogic principles. We don't talk about it explicitly a lot, but when we go into a system, we do an analysis of what the people could do to make the system not work. And we overlay a pretty intensive infrastructure there so that the cultural divide doesn't prevent an initiative from working. It's dealing with what is instead of what we would like things to be, which is the hallmark of leadership. And When I think about what's going on right now when it comes to our governance systems in this election, there's a lot of regenerative people work in there. When it comes to how we carry our stories, our ability to register real information and allow that real information to change our worldview, especially if our worldview defines our identity. We cannot get around the inside out work as we do the systems work if we ignore it what we're currently seeing in our political system will get worse. And we didn't even think it could get this bad, a lot of us. So that's one of the reasons why we focus on this. Staying on the cutting edge of all of this, it requires a lot of work. Conflict integration versus conflict resolution. What I just talked about when it comes to dealing with what is. Conflict in these systems is not something that can be resolved in terms of a linear process. It's circular. 
So what is our role in all of this? In terms of lifting up lessons learned from the interviews that we did this year, values-driven innovation. There's so many different ways to go when it comes to this work. There's a lot of money going in directions that could prevent holistic development from actually happening. And there was someone on this stage a little bit earlier when speaking about a big company who said, companies have to have a spine and be willing to push back. That's values-driven innovation, knowing that we're going to get hit hard sometimes. And we got to stand up and stick with it. Nothing is inevitable. That came up a lot, too. One of the things when it came to fashion that was really disheartening for me when I started working with Fibershed was talking to someone who said, oh, yeah, 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 wool and leather, that's fine. That's like less than 1% of the global fashion industry. It's 20% cotton, the rest is synthetics. There's nothing you can do to impact the global fashion system. I seem to remember the same thing being said about black people getting the vote, black people stop getting lynched, a lot of that stuff. I come from movements that believed nothing was inevitable. And those types of folks that know what it takes to do the impossible got to start talking to each other. And then betting money on the right answer. That's why we focus a lot on shifting capital, because capital is necessary to make this stuff happen. And I don't need to repeat any of this, because the regenerative economy panel really took care of that. But what it takes to educate those who need a little bit more education on why this is the right answer is our responsibility. And I think I just want to reflect that what I've seen today makes, that, makes it really apparent that the work is happening. What I would add there is re-emphasis on communications. Because one thing about social movements is we know how to party. And partying is part of the deal. We have to, the extending an invitation is really important so that it feels like a fun invitation, too. You're not going to invite somebody over your house like, hey, this is really the right thing to do. You should sit on my couch. I'm going to feed you dinner. And we're going to have a lot of fun. <laughs> That's not how you invite someone to your house. And a bland website with a bland brochure with not cool colors that's not engaging is not going to cut it. So betting money on the right answer is also attending to what it takes to have a really good invitation. And that there's no shortcuts in relationship. Sometimes it's hard to really explain how significant this connection is when I talk about regenerative people plus regenerative systems and conflict integration versus conflict resolution. I talk about that because I know how difficult it has been for me to do the work around racial justice that I've done. The level of historical and systemic oppression that has happened to get us to where we are today in all directions is a lot. And it takes a lot for people to unwind it and to create something different in their head. And I'm not just talking about race. So not taking the shortcuts, and that's also investing money in the right answer. It's not linear seeing progress when it comes to relationship developing. Building trust versus breaking trust actually requires investment. It requires tears. I cry a lot, and it requires us to do our own work, which is something that, you know, hurts a little bit sometimes. So investing in the process that turns knowledge to wisdom, to me, is this integration of regenerative systems with regenerative people. Doing our own internal work as we do the systems work and attending to the social infrastructure of the people as we attend to the ecological and economic infrastructure of our systems. If we do that, we can create this vision around sophisticated economic development that creates a vision that can bridge the cultural divides because people see themselves in it, they see their role, they feel acknowledged, they feel respected, and more importantly, they know that you are going to protect what's important to them because what's important to them is important to you. Thank you. <laughs>